Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. And I want to talk to you today about something that you hear us say a lot on the 11th hour. And it's the word destiny. Destiny is a big word. It is a tomorrow word. It is a word full of hope and mystery. It's a word that carries promise and it carries with it a destination. Now, let's talk about something just a minute. Now, Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, why do governments hate or love prophets? It is because they tell the truth. The truth's hard to swallow sometimes, but it is the truth. The truth burns within a prophet. The truth makes a prophet look legalistic. The truth creates courage within a prophet to override his feelings of fear and tell the truth anyway. The truth in a prophet makes them bold. Now, what makes a false prophet? It's when they refuse to testify the truth that Jesus is the Christ. Now, God has a destiny for each and every person. It is a destiny that God himself has chosen for them. It includes every good thing for that person. It includes every perfect thing for that person. It includes everything that cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. I don't know if you've ever thought about God having a destiny for you. He has a plan for you. He has a real destiny for you. He's not afraid of obstacles. He's not afraid of hindrances. God, he's not afraid of anything. There's no fear in him or about him. Now, I, I need you to, to know that. Destiny includes, now, I want us to look at something now, talking about this big word of destiny. Destiny includes the land also that they live in. Let me show you something by the Spirit of God now. Let's look within the big word of destiny. Inside that word, it includes the word destination. Notice that destination carries with it a nation. I want you to listen to that now. Within the word destination, it's destination. It carries within it a nation. Notice that the destination carries uh, the people in your future. See, in your destiny that God has made for you and planned for you, you have a destination. Well, within that destiny is a nation. A nation is the word for peoples. It's the word for persons. It's the word for, for people. It's, and so there's people in your future that will help you carry out this destination. There's people that God has placed within your path, a path so that you can walk in this perfect destiny that he planned for you. Hallelujah. And with this nation, now this is really big. In this, if there's a nation spoken of, then there is a land or an environment in which you live it out. Now, if you're called, let's just say, into ministry, because I'm in ministry, if you're called into ministry and you know within your destiny is a future of ministry, and you know that God is going to build something with you or your family and, and to live, or if it's a business, or if it's whatever destiny that God has prepared for you, he will not only provide people who think like you, but also a land in which you live it out, a place where it can all exist. You know, when God created Adam, he raised him up in an environment where Adam could thrive in his destiny. And anytime God has a destiny on somebody, and he does for everyone, then in that destiny is the word nation because there's a destination, a destiny and people. And then there has to be a land or a place in which you carry it out. 
Let's look at Genesis chapter 12 for just a minute. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Notice he said, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy, now that's people, and from thy father's house unto a land, there's land, that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. So there's a destination involved, and there's people involved. And it's a nation's coming out of you, Abram. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now we know his purpose is to be a blessing to the nation, to bring forth the Messiah. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's sons, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land, there it is, land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto, un, and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Notice the Lord's promise to Abram started with words, these words. Thy country unto a land, a great nation, shall all the families of the earth, people, and lands, nations, and places to live out that destination. Now, the Lord was going to give Abraham an environment in which to bring about his destiny. He needed a land for the nation within him to thrive. I don't know if this is good for anybody or not, but they, <laughs> he needed a land for the nation that was inside Abram, Abraham to, to thrive, not just survive, but to thrive. So he needed a land for him to do it in. Once Abraham was convinced that he would have a son in Genesis 15, the Lord immediately promised this land to inherit. Don't you notice that? Abram asked, how do I know that I shall inherit it? All right, let's look at it. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, un, said Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. He said unto them, So shall thy seed be. Now watch verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he he counted it to him for righteousness. Soon as he believed the Lord, it was settled in his heart. He's going to have a son. He's going to have seed as the stars of the sky. As soon as he believed that, then the Lord said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur, a land, and a people of the Chaldees, a people, to give thee this land to inherit it. Because he has to give him a place for his destiny to thrive. An environment. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So Abram believed the Lord concerning his seed, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now he needed land to inherit from the Lord in which his nation could live and thrive. 
See, the enemy always tries to occupy the land to keep you from your destiny. We'll, we'll say that again. I, I'm just kind of reading notes along here, teaching a little bit as I go, but I want you to hear the depth of what's being said. The enemy always tries to occupy the land to keep you from your destiny. Abram was told to leave his father's house and go to a land that the Lord would show him of. Did you notice that? Leave your father's house, go to a land, to a place I will show you of. But Abram carried part of his father's house with him. Lot. Lot means covering. God did not want Lot to be his covering. I remember one movie about Abraham and and Lot and all that it showed. And Lot said, I'm going with you, Uncle Abram, to protect you. Well, they had that right to be his covering. Well, Lot not only would be his, God didn't want him his covering. God wanted to be Abram's covering. Lot was someone or something, now listen close, that did not belong in Abraham's destiny. Did not belong there. He didn't belong there. And he went and wanted part of the land. Lot ended up being disobedient and immoral. And Lot actually sired two nations born from incest. Notice God told Israel to possess the land. They had gone into bondage in Egypt. And while they were in bondage, the enemy moved into the land to possess it. Why? Because without a place, destiny cannot be lived out. Hallelujah. I hope every minister, every, every believer is listening. Why? Because a possession of land... If you possess the land, you could hinder a destiny. Remember when, when uh, Jesus went across the, the lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee to deliver the madman of Gadara. When he got over there to the other side, those spirits that was in that man said, my name is Legion. In other words, there's at least 6,000 of us inside this house. So the, the Legion said, the one in charge of the legion, the one that was in possession, the rest of them were just housing there. But one was in charge. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. That was the same legion that went out to stop him on the sea. And he said, peace be still and all that. They were trying to kill the Son of God. It would have ended everybody in the boat's destiny, every one of you and I's destiny, and the madman of Gadara would have just been mad right into hell somewhere. So, but he couldn't stop him because the word's stronger than anything. And he spoke, peace be still, shut up and be still. There was a great calm. But remember when he got over there, that those spirits besought him saying, don't send us out of this country. We want to stay in this region, in this geographical land, because there." They were hindering a destiny. They were hindering a destiny. And Jesus sent them into the pigs who choked themselves in that sea. And then he told that man, go evangelize the land. Now, notice God told Israel they had gone into bondage. He told them to possess the land, but they went into bondage in Egypt. And while they were in bondage, the enemy moved into their promised land to possess it because if you possess the land, you can hinder a destiny. Because destiny is a destination, and a destination always has a nation and a location. Hallelujah. Exodus 23, 28, I'll just give you a few of these. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, and thou and the, 
and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I will, notice it's the land, the land, the land, which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed I will give it, and I will send an angel before thee, and will drive out the Canaanite, Amorite, Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite that had possessed the land while they were in bondage. They even possessed what we know as Jerusalem. So that when God's people finally arrived, if they can't have a, they, a nation cannot have a nation without a location. So they possessed it. Exodus 34, 11, Numbers 33, 52, 33, 55, Deuteronomy 4, 38, 11, 23, Joshua 3, 10, and 13, 16 is just a sum of the scriptures that talk about God driving out those inhabitants of that land so that a nation could have a location. These are just some of the verses of God driving the occupants off the land that he gave in covenant to Abraham in order for him and his seed to thrive in their destiny. All you see now is demonic forces trying to occupy the land given to free people to inherit. In order to live out the destiny of a nation, which is the Declaration of Independence, the land is being occupied with immorality and corruption. People have become afraid to speak out, to voice their opinion, to say anything. Corrupt government has threatened to jail them, harass them. The devil knows that without a land, a nation can't live out their destiny. Not only for them, but also to bless all nations or peoples. This is why Jesus, notice, you know, people look at the Sea of Galilee. And notice most all of Jesus' miracles happened on the Sea of Galilee. Almost all of them. Not all of them, but most all of them. And the reason being, notice it wasn't long. His first miracle, where was it done? In Cana of Galilee. Galilee was known as the heathen circle. It's also shaped like a harp. And so I believe it's tied to Psalm 8. I believe it's tied there to that. I believe that it was a location that when Adam, because it's, think about it, it's really the only freshwater lake like that. And it's worth more than gold. Because in the desert, whoever possesses all the water is the king. That's who runs the land. And so as soon as Adam fell, it's amazing how the Galilee became a region known as the heathen circle. It became a region known as the heathen circle. Jesus, the first miracle he did was in Galilee, Cana of Galilee. Then he made his way toward the Galilee. And then he walks on water on the Galilee. He calms winds and waves on the Galilee. He crosses the Galilee to cast out the, the demons from the madman of Gadara. He, does, he multiplies fish and bread on the Galilee. He gives the miraculous catch on the Galilee. It's the Galilee, Galilee, Galilee constant because there, if you look at an ancient map, you'll find that's where the giants had settled was around Galilee. Jesus went into that region to do battle in the spirit to free that land, to free that whole region. And so when he went into that land, then he started doing battle with the spirit world and he started taking them down. One at a time. Boom. Boom. Dealt with 6,000 at one shot in the madman of Gadara. And now they found just not long ago, I remember an article reading it on the, I think it's the, maybe it's the, I forget which tip of the Galilee it's under, but there's a, a big mound of basalt stone, bigger than Stonehenge, found. And each stone is 300 to 600 pounds. And someone carried it there and built like a pyramid-type structure up under the water, which probably wasn't under the water at the time. But all they can figure is it's either a mound for the dead or some kind of religious thing. It was back when all of these, but they date it back to the time of the giants. Jesus knew exactly why he went to Galilee. 
And he went there, and then he went eight miles above it to the headwaters of the Jordan, and he went to Caesarea Philippi where they were, they were celebrating the ceremony of Pan. And I want you to listen close to me in a, just a real quick story of it. They were celebrating the ceremony of Pan, and there was the rock of the gods, and there at Caesarea Philippi, they had a cave there where people offered goats and would throw it in the water. There was water in the cave then, and they would throw it in the water, and if the goats sank, then Pan accepted it, and if it didn't sink and it floated, then they had to offer a child. And they had it there where there was pandemonium would break out. What that means is, is that they believe Pan, that cave was called the gates of hell. And they believe Pan went into that in the wintertime and spent his winter hibernating in hell. In Hades, they called it. There was also a temple to Caesar there because they believed he was a god. So I want you to notice something. There was Pan and the government. Now you just need to understand that. There was a God made out of government and the God of Pan. And so when you went there, you know, and I remember Jesus is showing them all of this. Now, can you imagine that? Eight miles above the Galilee where the Jordan starts at the foot of Mount Hermon. And so there he's standing there and he says, Who do men say that I the Son of Man am at the rock of the gods? Say, some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah, one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say I am? Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. But my father, which is in heaven, told you that. And you are Peter. He was Cephas, but now he's become a piece of a rock. Peter is Petros. He said, this knowledge has made you a piece of a rock. And he said, on this rock, this Petra, Petros is who, what it made you, Peter. The Petra is where I'm going to build my church, this huge Gibraltar, this huge boulder that I'm the Christ, the son of the living God, not the rock of the gods. And then he pointed at that cave and said, and the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. Well, that was a prophecy because the church didn't exist at the time. He was prophesying a future moment when those gates would be opened again and do battle with the church. And so at the Gothard Tunnel in Geneva, Switzerland, they recreated the ceremony of Pan. Complete with the sexual orgies, complete with the deaths, complete with all the bondage and hell, and complete when it brought it out on the surface, just like what would happen at Caesarea Philippi. But this one took place in about 2015, 16, somewhere around in there. And like four clergymen or so from all different faiths blessed the ceremony. Think of that. And they brought, and in the ceremony, they brought Pan up out of hell and brought him on the earth. And as soon as he started coming up on the earth, and they even showed a man underground with a hat on, yodeling like some fool, with his, with his eerie yodel, and the goat man appears and looks at him. And he starts telling him to come on up, come on up out. And then they move it outside, and these people in these orange jumpsuits, communism serving Satanism on a platter coming up out of the gates of hell and getting up on the surface and then suddenly a spirit hits them. They break into a wild orgy just like the ceremony of Pan. That was known as pandemonium. And then people, they started, these eyes appeared. This goat man kept coming up on the screen like they were breaking him out. While this pandemonium was going out, they were luring him up out of hell just like Jesus showed those disciples. But Jesus gave a prophecy that the day will come when the church will have to do battle with this ceremony. And then suddenly, in the days of the church, they recreate it. Then they produce these shrouds and these angelic fallen beings. There was a transgender type angel underneath the ground. Topless flying around like an idiot. On the top, then these angels appear and start laying shrouds on people and they start dying. Pandemics, pandemonium, 
Pan suddenly then walked out on the stage. And three big-headed governmental officials bowed to him, whatever they were supposed to represent. But see, it's always in the days. There's the gates of hell, government, pan. And again, Jesus said this will happen in the days of the church, and the church will not be prevailed against but that denotes the church has to resist. And if the church don't resist and you just go ahead and just give in to this, these bunch of devils, you realize if every pastor in America, every pastor that claims the name of Jesus Christ, that claims the name of Christ would stand up and say, that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. We're not doing it. We're going back to the Bible. There's no, nothing in the world could stop it. Nothing. But they won't. They all won't do it because some of them have succumbed to it. They vote for abortion. They vote for uh, uh, corruption. They vote for anything immoral, ungodly, or fattening. They vote for everything. So they're not going to do it. Some of them, some of the pastors smoke pot in their office before they go on stage and preach. Some of them have temple prostitutes that sit on the front row that they, they use in their services in private, of course, and offer to guest evangelists. Is this going on in the churches? <laughs> I wish I could say it wasn't. But all of this, and we wonder what's wrong. You know, you can take a bunch of little swollen fat demons that, that sit around in a local area and just start peeping their little puny mouths against ministries and stuff like that. We've experienced that here. They're just, you know, they're cults. They're this, they're that, they're that, and they're fools. And their voice is insignificant. That's not the concern. The concern is when pastors jump in and start agreeing with them that call themselves witches. It's a dark time in the world right now. And it's getting darker. And we have to be the light. We have to be the light right now. We cannot be. We cannot be part of the problem. We have to be the light. Do wicked people understand what they are fighting? Do they? You are fighting the plans of destiny, says the Lord. A destiny that God has given. You are fighting against tomorrow. You cannot see what tomorrow holds. And you cannot see tomorrow's plans. You can only see the plans for tomorrow that you have deceived yourself, that you have made yourself. Well, you have deceived yourself, for your tomorrow is not tomorrow. It is dreams of today, which is not big enough to hold tomorrow. You who support transgenderism and mutilation, you are regurgitating the vomit of your father, the devil. You throw the puke up in your hands and then eat it again. And you act like you like the taste of it. The stink of it is becoming recognizable on you. For all to smell, especially the United Nations, that is a stink in, the, in my nostrils, says the Lord. Enough, enough, enough. I say it three times against your unholy trinity. You who have killed my prophets and destroyed them I sent to you. Their blood and the blood of all those nations whose destinies was included in their prophecies. Their blood I will require at your hands. O oh, United Nations. He 
hear the wind blow, it blows against thee. And the fire you have kindled will now blow back into your face. For your time has been put off and yet replaced. Harari, you challenge the Almighty. So be it. Swab, your replacement looms just behind thee. And the tunnel for which you conjured hell upon my people will be choked and stopped up. It has begun. For the United Nations is an altar of Satan. And the prophecy, the man of God prophesied against the altar of Jeroboam will be upon thee. Cowardly pastors and false prophets, you won't speak. What are you afraid of? A word from the Lord. Don't ask me to apologize for the word of the Lord because it can't be done. If it is done, you become part of the results of the prophecy. Hallelujah. So where are the pastors today? Where are those who claim the name of Christ? Where are those? Should we be shamed into not speaking the truth? What is the truth? Thy word, Lord, is truth. So should we be shamed into not speaking this? Or should we be ashamed of who authored this? No. We have to remember our calls. We have to remember to speak the truth. You speak it in love. You speak it not mad or have malice against anybody, but you speak it. You speak the truth anyway. Thy word, Lord, is truth. So we stand here today, or I sit here today, talking about the truth. And more will come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does 24 hold? The wind knows. The wind knows as it blows from 24. It knows. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been a heavy 11th hour today. It's been a sobering 11th hour today. Well, but Brother Robin, you know, it's always a heavy 11th hour. There's never any bunch of chuckling and laughing and rolling across the stage so that we could all enjoy the time of the 11th hour. There's nothing wrong with laughing. There's nothing wrong with great joy. There's nothing wrong with rolling and laughing. But there is a time for laughing, and a time for crying. There's a time for every season under the heaven, but no season lasts forever. Remember that. It don't just stay in one season constantly. You have wicked people from all walks of life, from the lowest to the highest trying to keep prophecy from coming to pass. Trying to plan a tomorrow. But Jesus said tomorrow takes thought of itself. Did you know that? That's amazing, is it not? That tomorrow thanks for itself. And wicked men can't see into tomorrow because they can't, they can't look into the light. So their tomorrow is the one they're planning. But tomorrow sees their plans coming and just moves itself out of the way. 
and they end up beating their head on something in frustration because they cannot bring it to pass. We've entered another time. We've entered a time where things will, will be seen and be seen more. Do not look at things as hopeless because to say it's hopeless is to say God is helpless. And God has not gotten his purpose done yet. So take great courage in this. And know that in your destiny, God has a plan. In your personal destiny, there is a destination. There is a nation. There are people that God has provided for you to be with, for you to meet, for you to know. And there is a place he has for you to go in and live out that destination, that destiny. Hallelujah. It's not the time to go into every little church and every place where you're not wanted. You can't go into a place where you're tolerated and expect to live out your destiny. You have to go into a place where you're celebrated. And God knows the group of people, the nation, and the place for you to be involved in. Make up your mind what place that is. Make up your mind. And where the Lord shows you, go there. Go there. It may be in your back door somewhere. It may be across the country. People say, well, I believe it's at Church International. Then that shouldn't you be there. But if it's a church in Texas, be there. If it's a church in California, be there. But be in the place where your destiny has a nation and a location. Man, I hope that got across today. That, that's something the Lord began to talk to me about as I got up this morning. He started saying that word. And destiny, destiny is a big word. There's a lot in destiny. So today, remember that. He has a destiny for you, but it includes a nation and a location. Hallelujah. And enemies try their best to move into your land to keep you out of it. But don't let these obstacles stop you from getting in your destiny. Amen. You know, Abraham had to fight some to get in his. Jesus went and did battle with all those spirits around the Galilee. He did battle with every demonic spirit on the cross and defeated them all. Jesus went into hell and paid the price and rose again after three days and nights and made a way for you and I to make it to our destiny and make it to our nation and our location. Nation is people. People. Location is where they've gathered to live out destiny. And I'm telling you, God has a place for you. So don't be, don't be all depressed about it. This nation ain't sunk. It's not. God still has a destiny, and he gave it to our founding fathers, and they made covenant with him. Woe to the person who tries to stop such a covenant. They find themselves fighting tomorrow, and the thing about fighting tomorrow is you can't see where it's at. You can see tomorrow this way and shoot at it, and it's way over here when, that, when you pull that trigger, so to speak. You swing at it with your blade and you're beating the air. You don't even know where tomorrow moved. Tomorrow sees what happened yesterday and what you're thinking today. And it just moves itself like a warrior. Hallelujah. Well, what you want to do today to start with is make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You want to make him Lord. You want to receive him as Lord and Savior. How do you do that? Well, Paul said you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's your Lord and you'll be saved. So what you do is you say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. And I give you my whole life right now. Oh, my goodness, there's not a devil in hell big enough to keep you from that. He's already defeated it all. He just opens his arms and says, come on. And now go ahead and say, cleanse me of all sin. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. 
Take my life. Do something with it. Forgive me of all wrong. And he will. And he will, and you can have the assurity that he'll do it. Because he said, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that was talking to believers. Hallelujah. So now that you've done that, you need power, explosive power happening in your spirit. So why don't you just turn around right now and just say, Jesus, baptize me in the mighty dunamis, the mighty Holy Ghost. Baptize me in the in the spirit of the living God in fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Then when you release a prophecy out of your mouth, then when you start talking the word, fire accompanies it in the spirit. And man, I'm telling you, your boots will be on fire till you tread ashes beneath your feet. Hallelujah. And now just say, baptize me in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I need to be able to speak in your language, Lord, a language the enemy can't understand nor stop nor keep from coming to pass. And then just say, thank you for it. And just start saying whatever sounds you hear. Oh, well, that sounds like foolishness, somebody watching. No, somebody watching that says that's foolishness is acting like a fool. So they think like a fool. So everything to do with God is foolishness. Hallelujah. If you think the power of God and the prophetic power that's in the word and the creative power of God, and you think that all that's passed away, and you think healing is gone, and you think prophets are gone, and you think apostles have disappeared, and you think all the power in this book that Jesus did when he was walking the earth is not available to us today, why do you even go to church? Why do you go? It's got to be the most boring time in all of your life. Because you're not expecting anything. Unless, of course, you live in a homosexual lifestyle or something and you go in there because you've got somebody with a rainbow to leap telling you how good you are. So all you're doing is going in trying to prop up your belief because you know something's wrong. I'm not going to pat you on the head about that because I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to, to suffer destruction. I don't want anything like that to come on you. But those big, fat, little, fat belly devils that's filled up on people's little puny mind thoughts, and they've just ate it until their bellies are full. And they breathe in the arrogance of all sin and sinners that are telling you, a man can sleep with a man and just have sex with a man and be okay. They want you with them one day. A woman can sleep with a woman. You know, it's perfectly natural. Then how come neither one of them produces life? How come neither one of them can have a child like that? It's against everything God made in his law of government, seed, plant, harvest. Has nothing to do with hate. It's just the fact it don't work. And it's abomination to the Lord, God in his system of seed and harvest. It's abomination to the Lord. It can't produce life. But you go in there and some fool with a rainbow to leap trying to tell you that God has just suddenly changed his mind from his word and says, this is now okay. Well, it's not okay. It's not okay and it'll produce death and you'll regret it one day. So just stop right there where you are. You can't stop on your own. You don't have the power. But he does and he can deliver you. So why don't you just ask him, Jesus, deliver me. I dare you to ask him that. But I don't want to be delivered now. There's the problem. You don't want to be delivered. You know, I remember one politician told a bunch of, uh, uh, they were going to have a big rainbow pride parade. 
And the politicians said to him, well, you can't perform lewd acts. You can't show any immorality going down through there like that. And they just called it off. They called it off. Why? Because they want to come down the street on a float with a leather and a ball stuck in their mouth, holding their mouth open like they're being tortured and leather harnesses and some man with a leather thong up his rear end walking, running around up there, acting like they're having anal sex with one another so that everybody can watch. Why would they want to do that? So that your children can see it. And as soon as the politician said you can't do that, well, we'll just call it off. That ought to tell you all you need to know. Hallelujah. That ought to tell you all you need to know. Get up there in front of a bunch of little children in their little precious minds that are looking to the adult world to teach them something. You get up there with a thong up your ass that's heading up on a float going down the highway. Teaching our children to become corrupt. Well, enough of that's enough, don't you think? Enough of that's enough. But we hate you, brother. You hated me anyway. You hated me anyway because I dared tell you the truth and I don't give you a cloak to hide your sin with. That's what you hate. You hate it because I don't give you a, a rainbow blanket over your head so you don't have to see your own sin. That's exactly why you don't like me. But you know what the difference is between you and me? Is I love you. And I just cannot stand the thought of seeing somebody go to hell. That's just a horrible thing. Do you know what hell is like? Hell. People say, you know, they just throw the word around. Hell, hell. And they say, some people say, well, if they're going to hell, and, and, and if it means li loving them or liking them would send me to hell, I'll just go to hell. Do you know what hell is? Hell is a place where the fire is never quenched and your worm dies not. It means whatever disease you died with, whatever sickness you died with, you suffer forever in the flames of, of hell. It means that it never goes away. It, it's talking about in Luke 16 with a rich man. He said, I'm tormented in this flame. It's talking about a silicious stone. It's talking about a black stone that they mark, a certain stone that they mark gold with and drop acid in the cut to see how pure the gold is. In other words, it's like having acid in your veins 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all eternity. That's what hell is. It's the absence of God where there is no light. You, it would be the struggle to breathe constantly because He is your life and the length of your days and He's your breath. So you, you can't hardly breathe in hell. And you experience the suffering of choking constantly. It's whatever sickness you died with. It's the pain and the agony of it constantly. It's, what, it's like acid in someone's veins. They just scream and they cry and they torment. And then on top of all of that, you lose your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And demons move into your soul and move out of your soul at will because they're tormented. And they, they move into a human soul trying to alleviate their pain of who they are. That's how they possess people in the world. That's why they do it. They're constantly, a spirit of fear is just that, afraid. And they move into the soul of a person. They move in trying to give you some of their fear so that they can have some relief. And the more they start, if they find someone who will let them in and let them in and alleviate just a little bit of their pain, they'll fill them up until they can become like legion in the Bible. But in hell, they move in and out because they, there's no relief. So they move in and you scream with the torment of the demonic spirit in your soul. And then it leaves and you scream with the regret and every message, every sermon, everything you've ever heard 
to receive Jesus. And every time you rejected it, you'll see it in your mind like a living color screen of a bad dream constantly. And probably not even color, just black and white haze going through your thinking. That's not even describing hell for what it really is. And you can't see any light. It's a constant thing. You know not what's coming. You're totally alone. When Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said, you brood of vipers. Well, that's an English translation. He said, you generation of vipers. John the Baptist said, you generation of vipers, you brood of vipers. And John the Baptist said something. Listen to what he said, but then listen. How could you call someone and tell them their mamas were snakes and they're from a generation of snakes? Because if you keep reading, John the Baptist said right after, who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath? He's saying nobody had the nerve to tell you this. Nobody had the nerve to tell you to flee from what's coming. And Jesus, you'll find in his teaching, he said, how can you escape hell? They both had a revelation of hell. And they knew what was coming. And so they pleaded and they begged. And Jesus, even on the cross, wouldn't condemn those that crucified him. He just said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And my heart goes out to those, especially those in a generation that's been fooled by those on the floats. There are people who know what they're doing, but then there's a whole generation has been deceived and don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There's a whole generation of young people that just think everything's okay and love is love and this is this and that is that. And they just pine away day and night. And then they finally run into a dead-end street where they have nothing left and they're so depressed they don't know what to do. And so they contemplate and take their own life and walk into eternity with a lie. So this is what I'm talking about. And this is why I would be graphic in saying things I say. Not to, not to just bash or be funny or condemn. It's so that you don't go to hell. Because the whole lifestyle of all of that leads to a denial of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I hope everybody heard my heart. You have to say, the Lord will prompt you to say certain things. Don't you think it was just as hard when Jesus said, you generation of vipers? They probably went, oh. and then he told them, how are you going to escape hell if you don't listen? Why don't you just give your life to Jesus and let him clean it all up? He can do it. Nobody has to condemn you. People's sin are ever before them. They know they're sinning. What's sad is the young generation who don't know the difference. But there's people on the floats. Jump off the float. The next red light, just get off and say, I wasn't raised this way. Hallelujah. Well, I'm sure that'll get a lot of mail. All this will get a lot of mail today. Somebody wrote and said, please quit cussing. You know, I, I don't cuss. And everybody that knows me knows it. But when I hear, when I'm under the unction of the Holy Ghost, and he says, say this, say that, I know. And I, I try to, sometimes you want to go, hmm. But the Lord is trying to get your attention. Hallelujah. 
So it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been a sobering 11th hour today. Krista, come on and receive our offering and just walk up into this atmosphere and